Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to a workshop on research opportunities in New England, tips and tricks from the archives. I'm Bob Ellison. I chair, I'm president of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. For those who don't know who we are, we're a scholarly organization based in Boston that is primarily dedicated to publishing primary documents. And our next volume will be the hundredth that we published since the 1890s, documents of early New England history, early American history, which are not only available in beautiful hardcover editions, but also fully searchable on our website. And the other big thing we do is every year we have a graduate student forum where we invite, oh, uh, some graduate students from around the country to come and present their work. And we've had now had over 170 rising scholars come. And I'm happy to say that a number of them now have become members and have published books, which when you come to our headquarters at 87 Mount Vernon Street, you'll be able to see a collection of books published by graduate forum alums. And so it's very exciting now to do this episode to help encourage scholarship. And I am delighted to introduce the chair of the panel, Anne Little, who also chairs the Graduate Student Forum. Anne M. Little is a professor of history at Colorado State University. She is a life member of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. And her books include The Many Captivities of Esther Wheelwright and Abraham in Arms on War and Gender in Colonial New England. And she has appeared three times on the TLC show, Who Do You Think You Are? And Little is a distinguished scholar. I'm really happy she put the panel together and she continues to chair the graduate forum. So welcome, Anne. Thanks, Bob. That was really nice. But I have to give all the credit to this event to uh, Megan Gilardi Holmes, who is running the tech for this event. She's the curator of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. And she was the person who suggested to me late last spring or early this summer, gee, you know what, what I think graduate students and young scholars might want to hear is more about sort of archival research and, and the archival opportunities that are available proximate to, to Boston in New England. Um, and so it, I, we really have to give Megan all the credit for doing this. Um, I also wanna give some, some credit too as well to Susan Lively, one of my committee members uh, and the vice president of the Colonial Society who was really instrumental in bringing Libby Bischoff in uh, to talk to us uh, and, and for suggesting Jean Selensky at Colonial Deerfield as well. Um, so I would like to, at this point, introduce uh, Libby Bischoff. She's a professor of history and the executive director of the, of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for, Cartography, for Cartographic Education at the University of Southern Maine in Portland and chair of the New England Regional, uh, Fellowship, Regional Fellowship Consortium the NERF C, as, as she calls it. Um, and so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce all of our speakers in turn and turn it over to them to speak for five or 10 minutes about uh, what they have in their collections and about any fellowships and fellowship opportunities available um, through their libraries. And also invite them to, to show us or tell us about a unique or interesting or particularly fascinating object or collection uh, that they super in, in, within their, their larger collection. So Libby, I would like to invite you to do this and also please uh, talk a little bit about the, the NERF C and the role that that has played in bringing scholars to do research, research at the Osher Map Collection. And thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us on a, a chilly December evening, which most likely for many of you, if you are in fact in graduate school is during the last week of classes or maybe bordering into finals week. Um, so thanks for taking the time and hopefully It'll be productive time for you as you get some time to think about your own work in between semesters. I know that was mostly the time I used to be able to think about my own work um, was when not teaching. So I am lucky enough to be the executive director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education up at the University of Southern Maine in Portland, as Anne said. Um, we have about half a million maps dating back to 1475, and we collect both globally and um, locally and regionally in scope. We have a particular strength in New England. Um, our collections are probably most well known for our 15th through 18th century collections, but as a 19th century U.S. historian, um, I've been really proud to steward um, the pretty extensive building of our 19th and 20th century collections over the course of the past couple of years. Um, our collecting priorities currently are maps made by women, 
maps made by people of color and maps showing indigenous land possession and dispossession. Um, I wanna mention, and I'll put our website in the chat. So we have been an organization since the late 1980s with a founding donor collection from the Smith family and then later the Osher family um, of really important maps, globes and atlases from about 1475, which is our oldest piece, which is actually um, a view, one of the first modern maps. It's actually a view of Palestine. And we have grown into the institution we are now. Um, we are wholly focused on educational outreach and supporting research and teaching. So we have a very significant K through 12 education program. Actually see this year we'll work with probably close to 15,000 K through 12 students um, in their classrooms, in our map library where they come on field trips, through map kits that we send to classrooms and, and through live online interactions. We also see about 200 university classes a year or one of the busier special collections in the country, all for customized um, visits based on whatever it is that you're teaching. So we're as likely to um, pull celestial items for an astronomy lab as to put together an elaborate session for a colonial New England history class, environmental science, nursing, social work, the arts, we do it all. We really um, love to teach with our collections and, and that's really what we're all about. We have a pretty robust digitization program. It's one of the reasons I'm really happy to be with you all tonight and, and share our collections. We have about 90,000 images from our collections fully digitized and searchable online on oshermaps.org. I put that right in the chat for you. Um, and we are currently in the process of switching all of our collections from a Zoomify viewer to a triple IF viewer. That won't mean much to any of you if you're not in the digital realm, but the triple IF is an open source viewer um, that allows for even better viewing of our images, but allows for downloading of high res images as well. So we do not watermark, password protect, charge for our images. They are free and open for research and use. If you publish them in archive in you know in journals and books as folks often do, you know we ask that we grant you permission for that, not for the act of granting position, but we love to keep track of where our images go. We have one of the nicest imaging labs in northern New England. We also digitize for a lot of other um, universities and museums and historical societies. I have three full-time employees who work in the digitization realm, making these collections viewable to everyone. Um, and I think it's really an unsung, like the folks who do the actual digitization and getting these materials up online that really facilitate this research we can do at a distance um, and, and make it possible. So Anne was kind enough to allow us to share an item from our collection to get people excited. Um, as a 19th century history, I'm actually a photo historian, don't, don't tell anyone. Um, but I now work, but I now work on maps. Um, one of the things that I've been really excited to highlight in our collection, we have a massive collection of educational materials, which have been um, used by some of the New England Regional Fellowship Consortium fellows who have come to visit us. But we are particularly interested in the ways in which history and geography have been taught locally, regionally, nationally, globally, um, from about the 17th century to the present. So we have considerable teaching collections, textbooks and things like that. But one of my favorite items in our collection, which I will share with you now, um, is a map made by a young woman, a map of the world. I'll just put it in full screen so folks can see it. So this is a manuscript map. It's a hand-drawn map. It was made in 1815 in Danbury, Connecticut by a young woman named Hannah Comstock. Um, and what's so interesting about this genre of maps, often referred to as schoolgirl maps, um, is that they really live at the intersection of understanding women's education, particularly in the early Republic, um, and the ways in which their education in penmanship, geography, embroidery, um, history, come together in the production of these really unique individualized maps. Um, in the female academies throughout New England, 
very prominent in Boston, Connecticut, New Hampshire. Maine had quite a few. Massachusetts, of course. Um, Vermont had many female academies and some of the most progressive female educators were coming out of Vermont. Um, we're teaching map drawing and map making as a way of bringing together all of these different arts. This one's one of my favorites. We have dozens of these in the collection. We correct, collect them pretty actively. Um, also copy books that, that young women make in classes as well, notebooks. Um, the one of the reasons I like this one and I always tell students that we work with, you know how you get an assignment and sometimes you only like part of it. I think our friend Hannah really loved to draw and didn't give a hoot about geography. Because if you look at the way she draws her maps, it's a really common dual hemisphere map of the world. These are all done by hand in an age before electricity. These are all made with a quill pen. They would have taken months of work. They were put on display at the end of semesters and sessions for the town to come in and see. But she loved watercolor and gouache. Um, we digitize at 100 megapixels so you can get really close into the detail and you can see all of her individual brush strokes and the beauty of these leaves. <laughs> the same with her flowers. And this era was known for its language of flowers. None of the flowers she puts in are accidental. They are all signifying particular virtues that were taught to young women. Um, and the blue ribbons, which we haven't quite been able to figure out yet, and I've asked everyone, so maybe someone on this call knows, are very common to these maps, always blue, regardless of the state they're produced in. There aren't any ribbons that are included in these that are not blue. Um, it is back when the color light blue was associated more with young women than men, but I think they have a deeper meaning beyond that that we haven't been able to crack. So these are things that we're really interested in, but if you're doing any work in early New England, um, we have one of the most spectacular map collections from that era, first printed map in New England, a lot of maps depicting um, early interactions between indigenous communities and settler colonists. Um, and we really work a lot with um, educators, with local tribal historians on reinterpreting these collections um, to kind of read against the archives. So we're happy to talk about that too. So just a little chance to wet your, your whistle about that. And um, I will just mention the New England Regional Fellowship Consortium that I will encourage all of you to apply for. It is a grouping of um, nearly 30 different institutions around New England who pool their resources and come together to offer collective fellowships to not only graduate students, early career, mid-career, late career scholars, um, folks working at the intersection of kind of art and archives, all sorts of, of fellowships. And the applications are due in early February. The link is in the chat. Thank you so much, Anne, for posting that for everyone. And the unique part about that is that we actually require fellows to go to um, distinct collections. So it's not just a fellowship to go to one collection. It is actually a fellowship that will allow you to travel around New England to three different member institutions, spending at least two weeks at these institutions. They're, they support eight weeks of funded research. It does not need to be eight consecutive weeks. You could do two weeks in December, two weeks in June, two weeks in August with the archives that you're working with. They're $5,000 each. Um, and we give at least two dozen awards every year, um, usually closer to 30. And the collaboration of these 31 different agencies, you can see everyone in the chat, but it ranges from, you know, Brown to various Harvard archives to, to archive, um, a few different archives in Maine, including us in the Maine Historical Society, certainly the Massachusetts Historical Society. Our lovely host tonight offer also offer a fellowship um, for a colonial project. Um, so really, if you're looking to travel at any stage of your project and you need to spend weeks in multiple archives, this collaborative fellowship is really 
a brilliant way to do that. We fund a lot of graduate students. Many fellowships say they do, but they're really looking for more early career or mid-career. But this fellowship supports a, a tremendous number of graduate students each year at all stages of the project, from early archival sort of conceptualization of, of what the dissertation might be, to visiting those last few archives to really solidify the last chapter of your dissertation. So we encourage you to take a look. And during the q and I'm happy to answer additional questions. And I will turn it back to Anne. Thank you so much. Thanks, Libby. That was wonderful. Uh, and as it happens, we have another NERFC fellowship institution represented coming up next. Uh, up next is Jean Selinski. She is the librarian for Historic Deerfield and the Pocomtuck Valley Memorial Association, um, which is kind of a mouthful, but it's actually a, an adorable <laughs> little library. I did a little research in there. Uh, I think it was last summer. Yeah, it's summer 2022 and had a great time and found a bunch of cool stuff. Anyway, Jean, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you wanted to also add any anything you would like to for the, the NERPC Fellowship, please do. Sure. Thanks, Anne. And welcome, everyone. And despite my um, short title of just librarian, I'll complicate matters by talking about two separate collections that I oversee in the Memorial Libraries. And that's the name we use for the building which houses both collections. So both collections overall support research in early New England, uh, life, local history, and the decorative arts. So I'm now going to break it down a bit. So Historic Deerfield's collection, and I'll refer to it as HD, the strengths are decorative arts, architecture, and material culture of early New England. So we have a great collection of American and English architectural pattern books. Um, another subset is the Wolf Collection that's named after the donor. Um, that consists of about 1,500 titles on color theory, paint, and varnishes. Um, it includes a lot of artist manuals. So um, a Nerf C fellow who was here several years ago working on um, a dissertation on surfaces made um, very good use of that collection. And another group of materials that I wanna highlight is the 17 journals of a Deerfield resident named Epaphras Hoyt. Um, they cover three decades from 1820 to 1850. And he was, um, could say he was like the local historian and old crank who liked to um, write his observations on absolutely everything. So, you know, the weather, military affairs, um, the Masons, he was very anti-Mason, um, religious matters. So for anyone researching the first half of the 19th century, um, his journals are great. We have them digitized and transcribed on the Internet Archive, but um, that doesn't mean we don't want you to come visit and use them in person. So the second collection I oversee is that of the Pocumtuck Valley Memorial Association, which was established in 1870. Um, it has a great book collection, many with a local provenance. But um, so if you're looking at the reading habits of one area, it's a great collection to dive into. But the star of that collection really are the manuscripts, um, extensive manuscript holdings deep in family papers, and diaries of local residents and account books of craftspeople, merchants, doctors, and farmers in the area. So for example, the general store that operated on Main Street in Deerfield from the 1740s into the 1840s, for that we've got about 50 ledgers that span um, 100 years. So if you're looking at economic history um, or you wanna track the flow of goods in one community, that's a wonderful resource to look at. There were also um, three generations of doctors in town. So we have many ledgers from the Williams family um, from the 18th century into the early 19th century. Um, and one Nerf C fellow um, who was studying medicinal tea in early New England um, used that group to um, make a case study in his dissertation. So that was that was um, quite a, a wonderful thing to see. So, and some of the account books and family papers um, have helped to show the presence uh, and labor of um, black people and enslaved people in the area. So those ledgers I, I just mentioned about the general store, um, 
that's a treasure trove, you know, to find names of African Americans. So, so that gives you a brief idea of the collections. Um, I did not unfortunately bring um, a picture of my overlooked item, but something that I recently rediscovered um, is in the Deerfield Town Papers in the PBMA Library. It's a 1780 resolution signed by John Hancock um, um, about using the land of a Tory in Deerfield for pasturing cattle for the army. So, you know, it's always that, aha, you, you just love seeing a name you know, and you know the big John Hancock signature going, oh, it does relate to Deerfield. So he was writing to Deerfield um, about this land, and there's that sort of opens up this whole saga of this Tory who lived um, in Deerfield and um, went against his family who were patriots. And, you know, then he skipped town, went to Canada for a time, um, and his land was later confiscated and sold. So um, at the moment, I'm working on a um, grant to catalog some military documents and scan those, transcribe those, get those into um, the PVMA database. So that's why that one um, just is something I want to talk about. So, and it's wonderful, um, you know, for people who are studying a lot of topics and they focus on more urban areas because there's a wealth of information in um, repositories in the Boston area or Providence or the big capital areas to have a really deep dive into a more rural area. You know, we've got so much documentation. So it's it's what I'm trying to highlight is the fact that, you know, we can expand these stories and use a rural environment as a case story, as a case study and tie Deerfield into a larger narrative. So, so please think about that. So for our fellowships, um, HD is a member of the NERC C. So, um, and for any applicants, also think about using the PVMA library. That's that's totally fine. We want you to do that. Um, we also debuted a new research fellowship this year for graduate students and others for a period of four to six weeks of study in the library. So it is meant for immersive library research, but fellows can incorporate objects from both museums, HD and the Memorial Hall Museum. That's the name of PVMA's museum. So, um, you know, it's, it's you can bring together documents and objects. So, um, you know, to study material culture. So our deadline is April 15th um, for next year. The application is online. Um, the stipends for the four-week fellowship is $2,500 for six weeks is $3,750. Um, so we hosted two fellows this fall and one graduate student um, is working on a dissertation on women using craft to disseminate scientific knowledge in the 19th century. And one chapter is on Ora White Hitchcock. And she illustrated the scientific works of her husband, geologist Edward Hitchcock. So she looked at his books, um, artist manuals, um, and school books also to understand how science was being taught then. So she also looked at um, botanical charts in the HD Museum and a dress of hers in the Memorial Hall Museum. So it's a wonderful marriage of objects and documents. So, um, so yes, please, um, I'll put the link to the fellowship um, in the chat um, and do your best. Oh, thanks, someone already did that for me, thank you. So um, do your best to search our online catalog. Um, the library, HD's library webpage does have um, the link to our online catalog, which is just for HD but it also includes subject guides that pull um, material from both library collections. So that's very helpful. So you'll see subject guides for the American Revolution, education, women, death and mourning, enslavement and, and more. So those guides are especially helpful because PVMA does not have an online catalog yet. So, um, but the, on the fellowship page, um, there is a link to the PBMA library page. I know this is really confusing. 
So it does list finding aids for the family papers, the diaries, the town papers, and gives you a listing of account books. So do your best to try and search for material, but please reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I'll help guide you through the application process for either fellowship. Um, just another note, but if, please don't leave it to the, the, the day before the deadline because you may not get a very substantive answer. So you've got to give me a little time too, but I'm really happy to help because I know it's confusing trying to research um, both collections. So happy to help. So that's that's all I've got. Well, that's remarkably generous. I've never heard a librarian <laughs> offer to help fellowship uh, applicants <laughs> with their applications, but that, uh, and so I hope any of you considering applying will take advantage of, of Jean's generous offer. And um, last we have uh, Karen Mull who is the director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library and a professor of history at Brown University. So Karen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Anne. Um, it's delightful to be here. Excuse me for one second. It's very dry here in New England. Did anybody mention that? It's like I'm desiccating, even as I sit here. Sorry about that. Anyway, it's delightful to be here with all of you. And thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. Thank you for a few minutes um, for me to talk about the JCB. I'm going to share some slides. I mean, I was so transfixed by Libby and Jean's descriptions of their libraries. And I confess, I was starting to like Google and start to hit the links there. Um, but let me get my slides going here and I'll give you a brief introduction to the JCB. Hopefully you are actually seeing some slides and not my, not just my, not just my screen and my messy, shocking number of unanswered emails. <laughs> okay, great. So the John Carter Brown Library. <laughs> okay, really, I'm ready. All right. The John Carter Brown Library um, is a pretty traditional um, library in a lot of respects. The JCB um, is on the campus of Brown University, but it's an independent library. We're a member of the Independent Research Libraries of America, the IRLAs. IRLA libraries. Um, so we sort of have the advantage of being both things. That is, we're situated at Brown, and yet we are also an independent research library. The John Carter Brown Library originated in the collection of, yes, John Carter Brown, um, who is a member of the Brown family, um, kind of famous or infamous um, merchant family of 18th century Providence. Um, and uh, he was a collector and in the mid 19th century, he committed himself and a considerable amount of his fortune to beginning to collect in the early Americas. And the JCB has been focused on the early Americas. It's been a hemispheric collection since 1846 when he made his first massive um, purchases. So uh, when we say hemispheric, for me, shorthand to the JCB's collection is that um, we are primarily a library, not an archive. So primarily we have printed materials, not manuscript materials, although a little bit of a caveat there in a moment. Um, but we have um, extraordinarily rich collections in early um, New England published materials, 17th century materials. I think Libby and I have the same um, copy of the Hubbard map. Um, and <laughs> um, but we have an equally strong um, collection in 17th century uh, Mexico City and 16th century Mexico City and 17th century Lima. So we are truly hemispheric, both North and South America and the Caribbean, the full early Americas and Atlantic context. Um, and so the JCB is, um, you know, when I say it's a traditional library, in that the kind of the concept of what is, was being collected at the JCB was absolutely from that originating moment in the mid 19th century, this kind of concept of the early Americas, not the concept that we would share now, 
we speak frankly of the JCB as a library of colonialism, which it, it is. Um, John Carter Brown would have described it as a library of the era of discovery. Um, what we see is um, European knowledge and indigenous knowledge equally represented in our collection. So um, kind of classic European texts and some um, unique European texts, and also um, hundreds of indigenous languages from the very southern tip to the very northern tip of North, North, uh, South and North America. What you see on the right is a manuscript um, vocabulary in Guarani Central American language. Um, we also have kind of um, an incredible collection of English language materials. A lot of people who've used the JCB over the years um, have thought about the JCB's um, powerhouse collection in Portuguese languages, indigenous languages, um, and Spanish languages. But it's also true that we have an incredibly rich English language collection. I happen to highlight here um, an item that is um, a classic of early American text, a history of the American Revolution published just shortly after the end of the revolution that was owned by Nicholas Brown, one of the Brown brothers. It's also true that although we are primarily a library of printed materials, of books, maps, and broadsides and other printed images, we also have an extraordinary manuscript collection in the form of the Brown family business papers, which is uh, thousands of boxes of materials documenting this merchant family and their global enterprise from the early 18th century through the mid 19th century. And I mention that here because um, as one does one day I, as a library director, I spent a lot of time on things like HR and fundraising and other kinds of administrative joys, which, you know, if you believe in your mission, these things are a joy. Um, but every now and then I need a little bit of, um, you know, kind of archival joy to um, leaven that. So I was um, working through some, uh, some boxes in the Brown family business papers, and I came across some letters from William Gordon to Nicholas Brown really right after, it was in 1780, I think. So, it, you know, the revolution had not concluded, but he essentially was soliciting subscribers to the history of the American Revolution that he had yet to write. And he was like, I want you to be one of my, can you please give me money? Can you, anyway. Um, and I wondered, gosh, did they ever give Gordon any money? I wonder what happened. And it's very gratifying to be able to take this little manuscript uh, back and forth and go to the library collection and be like, yes, and there it is, there is the book. So I think this encapsulates um, kind of, not that everything fits together that neatly, not, not at all. But the point is that we have this really dense, rich, powerful collection of printed early American materials, the full breadth of early America. And we also have a manuscript collection that in many ways complements the ways that the Browns were thinking about what the early Americas meant in the 19th century. And of course we continue to collect. Um, so um, there's always so much more to learn about what's um, at the JCB and any library thinks about its collection um, in different ways and over time um, comes to describe its collection differently. So for example, um, we do not have a way in our catalog currently to describe um, uh, marginalia or um, in particular to flag women's ownership or authorship or creativity within our collections, but there's loads of it. You can just open any one of a whole bunch of books and just find examples, um, just unbelievable number of examples of women scribbling all over books and claiming, claiming their books. Um, and in fact, just this week, I published a piece writing about um, a Brown family member, a woman, a sibling of the four classic Brown brothers that nobody had ever <laughs> really written about and whose um, account books in our collection um, had been uncatalogued. So there's always more to learn about what's in a library collection beyond what we know is in our collections. Um, and that's um, part of the interesting work of exploring um, any library. The JCB um, over the last two years has undertaken a welcome and access plan, which really marries both pieces um, firmly. That is, we're a commitment to accessibility um, and also to welcome spaces like ours. We have a very beautiful building that was built in 1904 to look like a gentleman's library. And it was built um, not for people like me, 
and not for many of the people on this call. It's a very exclusive space. So we produced a renovation, a gentle renovation of the front of the building that provides physical access for mobility challenged folks, but also provides through a new set of glass doors, um, a more welcoming environment into the building. But that physical renovation is really just the kind of one, um, it's a kind of surface gloss on what we mean by welcome and access. We also have a commitment to digitize the entire library over the next 10 years, and we're at about 28% now. And we launched a new digital platform also in May called Americana. It's at JC, americana.jcblibrary.org. Um, Americana is chiseled in uh, over the plinth at the JCB. I always thought of Americana as something kind of kitschy in mid 1950s and like my George and Martha Washington salt shakers. But John Carter Brown, when he thought about Americana, he meant this kind of commitment to a hemispheric early America. Um, so Americana is the name of our digital platform and it and reminds us to be kind of thoughtful and even critical as we engage with the infrastructure of our library, as well as the actual physical. Um, infrastructure. So we have also a robust um, fellowship program. We fund about 50 fellows a year from around the world to visit the JCB. Um, we have both short-term and long-term fellowships. Um, short-term fellowships at the JCB are two months. That's our shortest fellowship, two months to four months long. And long-term fellowships are five to 10 months. And you can find those um, at the um, at the URL that I've directed there and and maybe putting them in the chat. I can't see the chat at the moment. Um, but we also have um, a new fellowship for indigenous communities that is a very differently configured um, fellowship opportunity where um, indigenous communities may um, designate someone to um, to work on their behalf from within the community. So um, those are the kind of three fellowship opportunities we have right now, indigenous communities, um, uh, short-term research fellowships and long-term research fellowships. I mentioned that we have a commitment to welcome and access, which really um, pervades all of the work we're doing at the library. It runs through our programming and staffing and it's present in our fellowships too. So um, all of our short-term fellowships are remote eligible as well as um, residential. There are lots of reasons why folks can't take up a residential fellowship. Um, there are lots of things that are great about a residential fellowship. There are lots of things one can do. Talk to library staff, for example, who know so much about what's in collections. Talk with other fellows. Um, but there are many reasons why it's very challenging to do that. Care responsibilities, mobility for us, because we fund so many international scholars, sometimes the visa situation is really challenging. So we provide that, that remote option as well. And we have committed to the seminar group that we run for our fellows um, every week, which is really um, a really terrific and robust um, intellectual community for fellows is fully hybrid, as well as all of our programs are fully hybrid. So we can welcome all of our fellows who are joining us remotely or who are in Providence with us. So um, that is, I think, um, that's my quick summary um, of the JCB, and I'd be super happy to um, to talk about any of that or more. Karen, could I ask just a quick question? I think you're one of the rare, uh, you have one of the rare fellowship opportunities where you provide housing for the fellows. Is not is that not true? I, I think when I visited there a couple years ago as a fellowship reviewer, I saw like a new sort of fancy dormitory that that uh, had recently been built for your fellows. Is that correct? Um, fancy dormitory is a great way to great way to put it. Um, we have so Providence is a very beautiful city. It's a city that I've only been in Providence for two years, so I can say all kinds of nice things about it. it has nothing to do with me, obviously, but um, it has really beautiful um, historic architecture. And just three blocks from the JCB, we have. Um, a fellow's house, the firing house, and below market um, rental rates um, by the month. But it's a beautiful 19th century house, and we have space for um, nine fellows with private bath, and I think two shared, I can't remember. Anyway, the house also has um, a shared kitchen, dining room, living room, and library, all of which in kind of um, very 
not exactly grand, but very gracious and generous 19th century proportions. So it's a, it's a lovely space. Fantastic. Thank you very much, all of you. This is just perfect. This is just the little nibble, the little taster, the little, uh, what do you call those? Amuse bouche, right? Uh, before the meal. Uh, so I want to open the floor to anyone who wants to ask a question, either put it in the chat or raise your hand and Megan can um, maybe call on you somehow. Um, but while people are sort of gathering their thoughts, I thought I would ask a, a selfish question. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, in the last couple of years that I've been on the, the Graduate Forum uh, Program Committee, I have uh, noticed an uptick in, pro in, in proposals uh, from graduate students who are working on environmental histories. And it struck me that there are all kinds of interesting ways that um, potentially one could do environmental historical research in all three of your different libraries and collections. And I was wondering if each, each, each of you would sort of speak to what you saw as the potential for environmental history scholarship in your collections. Sure, I'm happy to jump into that if that's okay. Um, I see us being pinned. I'm trying to follow myself on the screen. Um, here we go. Um, I think maps are a profoundly underutilized resource. I, I feel like I'm probably morally obligated to say that as someone who runs a very large map library. But as an historian, I'm a visual historian, I'm a public historian, I teach history in this way. I used our collections long before I led them. And I think particularly in historical research, the trend is still too much towards image as illustration and not as source. It's gotten better in the past 20 years, but not, it does, it's not where it needs to be. Um, and certainly like one of the seminars that I teach quite a bit is visualizing history and really helping students make the transition into using visual sources as their main sources. In terms of environmental history, just even looking at colonial era maps, since I'll speak to the topic where we're sitting together tonight, um, they're really like looking at maps and charts over time are incredible in terms of figuring out sea level rise, resource use, um, we were do we've been doing a lot of work with environmental organizations who are looking, for instance, at saving seagrass meadows, um, which are really rich parts of Casco Bay. The Gulf of Maine is warming at a faster rate than most any other body of water. Um, and it is profoundly changing the fisheries and everything else. These early maps and charts, because we're a colonial, <laughs> a very colonial collection in some ways because the British and the French and the Spanish and the Dutch, but particularly in Maine, the British and the French, were so interested in these places as resource extraction and fishing ground, that's what they map. So you get very specific, the water at this time of year is literally at this height. This is where the marsh starts and this ends. There's so many notations, both manuscript and also printed on the chart that show change, I mean, I explain always to my students, history is simply the study of change over time, right? It's many other things, but that's one of them. And the maps of the same areas by different people over the course of hundreds of years show a profound level of change over time environmentally. They also show a profound shift in resource access. I would argue that we have a massive collection of survey, manuscript survey maps, um, so does Maine Historical Society. They have all the great proprietors collections. These are unreal in terms of even understanding down to the particular trees and particular forests, like why certain, what was the impulse, right? And to, to sort of cutting these particular trees or building a sawmill at this intersection. And we've been working with, you know, tribal historians and tribal scholars to look at these over time, like in conjunction with even how in the 1780s and 1790s, the way access is granted in Maine to lots by the proprietors and how that cuts off access to the river for the indigenous populations. So you can have very nuanced discussions of this in your teaching and your research, 
just simply by looking at these at these maps. So it's not just a visualization of the environment, but they also tell so much about use, both through imagery and text. Mm -hmm. And I'll say Deerfield is an agricultural community, always has been. So there's a lot in our resources about how the settlers and farmers use the land and use the resources. But I'm just gonna highlight trees because um, with Libby talking about maps, um, a recent donation is a group of trolley maps from the 19 teens about the trolley line that went through Deerfield and neighboring towns. And it noted the trees along the main street and they, the elms and the maples. And the elms were hit by a disease in the late 1920s and are no longer there. So we know from these trolley maps and you would not think about something like that normally that we know where they were on the street. And there were surveys done in the early 1900s um, about the trees. And so there's, there's a lot of information there that you know, you just think, well, we don't even have to go into the 17th century. We can just talk about 100 years ago and see how the street changed so radically. So, and, you know, it was all these tourist guidebooks were touting, you know, the shady elms along Main Street. Well, you know, they're not there. So there's a lot of different ways to um, look at that topic, as, as Libby was saying. So, and maps are critical. I'll just add um, two quick things and about um, environmental history. We obviously we see a, a lot of um, scholars working on aspects of environmental history and um, an incredible uptick in folks focused on history of food and foodstuffs, for example, um, whether individual items, um, particular um, I was just talking with a fellow at lunch today who's working on coffee. Um, and so there, you know, there is kind of a deep and rich environmental history that can be tracked through particular the growth and um, development and commodification of particular foodstuffs. Of course, also natural history and botany. Um, they're moved through, you can see in, in print history, manuscript history maps, obviously, and, and images as well. But the other thing I want to mention is that, as I remind our uh, folks all the time, that we're sitting in a library that is full of um, biological material, <laughs> that everything in our library is the paper is, this is early modern paper, it is made of linen, these um, books are bound um, in skin, and there's a lot actually that we can tell from the physical properties of these objects, um, from the inks and the dyes. And um, so there, there are just lots of ways to approach um, history of, of the environment, I think, from these kinds of special collections. Wow, that's really terrific. And, and thanks for sharing all those particular specific examples. I can tell that you're all very sort of dedicated librarians, really interested and curious about your own collections even. I have another question. Uh, I'm still waiting for other people to, to ask questions. So please raise your hand or drop a question in the chat and I'll be happy to read the question if you're too shy to, 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 to announce it yourself. Uh, but my question is, Considering that you all have such a, an aggressive and admirable commitment to opening your collections to the world through digitization, I was wondering if you could also speak to the value of scholars consulting your collections in person. And in particular, I guess what I'm wondering is, have there been examples or, or recent or not so recent um, encounters with with a researcher or a scholar where you've learned something new about your own collection because somebody came to you with a, a particularly interesting or different question and found something interesting uh, and brought that to the, the attention of the, the wider community of scholars that you work with. I can I can start um, just just briefly um, to say that I think that 
the value of the in-person interaction with the object can't be overstated, but also that I really, I think it's really important that we just talk about how our in-person experience of the object is different from our experience of the digital object. And that there are many things we can do with the digital object. Right now, our ability to digitize is mostly <laughs> really flat. That is that we're not, I mean, on our new on our new platform, we are trying to represent scale. You can see that we've got measurements. We've got, um, literally we pose things together. You can put them together on a virtual desktop. And so you can see them in scale, but otherwise ordinarily when you go to look at something, it all looks the same on your screen, right? You don't have a sense of its weight, of its heft, of its smell. Come on, old books, there's a whole thing about how they smell. It's very serious business. Um, and I think back to that point about the biological object, um, there's a reason why they they have that kind of old booky mm -hmm. smell, old early modern ones anyway. Um, don't get me talking about the smell of modern books. I don't know about you 19th and 20th century people, but, um, but uh, you know, there is something about uh, our sensory perception of the physical object that is different from the kind of perceptual approach that we can bring to the digital object. I think it will behoove all of us to be thinking about how we can help researchers to think about their perception of the digital object and to enhance our digital provision to emphasize what capabilities the digital has that the physical doesn't. I think that's going to be quite important. In fact, I think we will continue to see a divergence, but not um, you know, right now, I think people say, oh, there's nothing like being in the presence of it. But honestly, there's nothing like being, you know, able to manipulate a digital object either. So I, I think we're going to continue to see a divergence, but also an appreciation for both um, of those approaches. As for what scholars um, find in the collections, it's like every day, you know, I walk through the reading room and someone's like, hey, did you, hey, did you, did you want to come see? And you're just like, Pow, Pow, it's amazing. I mean, there's no, um, it, you know, even things that in my short time at the JCB, even things that I know pretty well, you know, you just turn something over to someone else and they see it completely differently, which is the great value of collaboration, right? Which is why scholarly community is so incredibly potent and um, exciting and worth cultivating. Oh, I would love to put in a plug for this group for the radical transformative power of teaching in the archives. And not just for one visit, but for multiple. And I think that's what we're most proud of in our collections. We will see 200 university classes this year. And those acts of discovery with us and seeing the collections differently are mostly from working with undergraduate and graduate students in interdisciplinary fashion. So I'll just share my screen really quickly and show you one of those kind of aha moments of why it pays to look at collections with other people, particularly students. So. This is a really beautiful um, planetary system chart from the 19th century. It was from it was for classrooms um, when it opens up. Here we go. Um, it actually looks like looks like this. Um, and if you can see this version of it, and then I'll go to this version of it. We were working with art students one day. And one of the students was like, this is really interesting paper that this is made on. How do you think this was meant to be displayed in the 19th century classroom? And we were talking about it and he and I kept going back and forth with it. And when we were looking at this part of the paper, he said, well, what would happen if we shone light behind it? Do you think it was meant to be shown in that way? So we took our cell phones and sort of backlit and the whole thing started glowing. And so it was this really interesting discovery with an art major to say, oh yeah, no, this was meant to be held up to the light in a 19th century classroom as many of our astronomical collections were in a fascinating way to get this kind of different experience. And then we went back and reshot um, the portfolio on a light table. So you can actually even online experience the way that it glows when it's backlit behind it. And so I agree, Karen, I mean, the Osher Map Library has been digitizing for almost 15 years. 
Um, it's really interesting now to go back and reshoot a lot of those early collections that we shot. It's about the, demo the democratization of access, I think, in terms of we really want you to be able to see these things regardless of where you are. But I am noticing a real backlash to the digital. <laughs> more people are actually calling me on the phone instead of emailing. I welcome that, by the way. No more email. Um, but people really, especially kids, I mean, we work with thousands of K through 12 kids, love the tangibility. It's like novel to see old things and they love it and are really embracing it. And I think that love of archival materials and, and being able to access them and discover them and see them and the materiality is so important. So I'm always, hand listen, I mean, I can't travel nearly as much as I once did for my own scholarship. So if these collections weren't digitized, I would be doing, I would not be doing any more scholarship. So I think it's really important in that way, but I always hope it's a gateway to physically come in. Um, I mean, we can bring them to you in this way, but that magic of archival discovery in person is really like nothing else. I mean, nothing makes me happier than seeing someone's eyes light up when they get something in a different way because they've seen it in person. Mm -hmm. And people are really, I mean, we, ca we can't keep up with all the people who want to come in and see things in person in a teaching environment. So it's a great problem to have, but one that I really encourage people to take up even, you know, as you're, as you're teaching yourself. I will say I'm at a real disadvantage because we are just in the infancy of doing any digital work. So we're so far behind the OSHER, the JCB and other libraries. So we need people to come in. Um, but I've noticed with working with um, students, college students, that you know they expect everything to be digitized, but they also just stop. You know, they look at an image online and they stop with it and they think that's the be all and end all. And if for people who come in, we can suggest other complementary source material for them, for the researcher to work with. And I think I've always viewed digitization as a way to tempt people to come in, you know, learn, reel them in and then show them even more wonderful things. And, um, then it's one, it's great to work with researchers and find out even more from them, like, you know, Libby and Karen were talking about. A current, uh, well, I shouldn't say current, she left a few weeks ago. Uh, um, a researcher who was in for four weeks, who is um, an expert on deaf history, she came to look at, read all the letters of um, two deaf mutes from one, Deerfield family in the early 18, 1800s, early to mid 1800s. And one resident in Deerfield, another deaf person um, in the 1840s, he died on the railroad tracks. So a, a train um, killed him. So we always thought, well, this is an isolated incident, but because she's done so much research, she was able to tell us that in that decade, there were about 10 other men, deaf men who attended the same school in Hartford that died the same way. And that just completely changed, you know, our perspective of this guy. We thought it was a one-off incident and wondered, well, you know, was it a suicide? Because couldn't he feel the vibrations along the, the railroad tracks? So obviously something was going on and she hasn't figured it out, but it's just, another like weird coincidence that someone could 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 inform us of of something we didn't know. So there's that um, back and forth, that whole dialogue between librarians and archivists and researchers that is just so vital for all of us to learn even more about the resources that we have. Thank you. That's that's really great. We do have a question, a couple of questions now from, from our audience. Um, actually, this is uh, from Timothy Hastings. He was one of our um, graduate forum participants last summer um, or late last spring. And he wonders if you have any suggestions for crafting an engaging and hopefully successful NERFC application. And I wrote, and back, in, I wrote back in the chat too, and oh, okay. <laughs> I'll happily just voice 
because you have individuals from 31 different institutions reading these applications, we all we read we all read all of them and focus on ones that highlight what institutions they want to go to and have a large discussion at our spring meeting. One thing that really stands out in applications is your ability to be specific about the collections you want to see, mm -hmm. right? Not just, oh, I'd love to go to the Osher Map Library. Maps are really important to my project. I'm hoping they have X, Y, and Z, or they have lots of 18th century colonial maps. I know that will keep me busy. Um, there's a nice happy medium between the general and also you listing out 73 things specifically that you want to see <laughs> in the collections that's sort of evidence that you did a little legwork during your application, maybe reached out to Jean, maybe reached out to Kid and others at Mass Historical, maybe chatted with Susan about the Colonial Society, that spending a little time talking about your project to the folks at these institutions, finding out what collections or what resources might really help you along the way, goes a long way towards a successful application. You certainly don't have to do that to be successful. The full conceptualization of your project is also really important. But we spend a lot of time going back and forth over it. You really, you need to spend two weeks at each institution. And the archivists and librarians and others who, who read these, a lot of that initial, you know, looking at is, well, they say they want to spend two weeks here, but say they only want to look at one collection that's one manuscript box. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to occupy them for two weeks. So I think paying attention to that two weeks at each collection and what kind of work you might need to do while you're there with particular collections is really, really helpful. And folks on the NERFSI, in the NERFSI institutions, really welcome and encourage people to reach out and have these preliminary conversations. Like as Jean was making that point earlier, we're really happy to have them. I mean, not the night before, as she said, I mean, not January 30th, um, but in the next, certainly over break and in the next couple of weeks, um, we're more than happy to help with, with that. So I think that ability to be specific and, and really prove that, yeah, I need two weeks at each of these places. Yeah, I echo everything Libby has said. So be as specific as you can. Um, you don't need to list a hundred objects, but just you know, be very focused on what you want to see and make sure it's appropriate. I will be able to suss you out if if we don't think <laughs> it's a good fit. And Karen, I wanted to um, sort of maybe extend Timothy's question to you. Uh, not about the NERFC fellowship, but maybe if you could sort of give the students in the audience uh, a, a good overview of what makes a good application to the JCB fellowships. Yeah, I think we, we have a slightly different, maybe a slightly different uh, take on things. I think because our collection is both focused and broad, that is early Americas, but there is this kind of breadth. Um, you know, I think applications are really about how um, how compelling the project is, um, how ambitious the project is, and how a fellowship at the JCB could help support that project. So let me just stick with the example of, um, it's not fair to use an example of a current fellow, but I'm going to because I was just at this lunch today, um, who is looking at um, coffee plantations um, in Jamaica. And, um, you know, the application really described a dissertation project that is focused on coffee plantations and that's focused on um, kind of what more we can learn about enslaved labor and um, political organizing from looking at coffee plantations. So, it, it, you know, it, this is not a, an application that would list every piece of our print or, you know, image, you know, collections that could help address it. Unlike, for example, if I personally was going to write an application to the Mass Historical Society, I can see Kit is here, but they're not represented in this group right now. But, you know, in my work, I focus on family collections. So I would list, I want to look at these five family collections because they're huge and they would have a lot for me. But for us, you know, it's really the um, the the project itself because there we can support 
just about any project, honestly, in the early Americas. So it's, um, you know, kind of the creativity and the energy and um, and the person needing to be doing research, right? It, you know, because we're funding research fellowships, not writing fellowships. So. Mm -hmm. I hope that's clear. Mm -hmm. We have another question. I don't see any other questions right now. Um, I'll give people maybe another second to formulate a question if they want to ask a question. But I think this has been a really helpful and valuable overview, not just of the particular goods and uh, particular items in your collections. Well, do we have another question here? Oh, yes. Here we go. Um, Oh, not another one from me. Oh, I was just adding something. Another comment from Libby. Um, but uh, this, is a bit, this has been a really effective overview of your collections and also of the, the value of both the digitization work that you're doing and of the, the power of the human connection between the librarians and the researchers. Um, I haven't heard, maybe this will happen. I hope I will long be long gone by this point, but I haven't heard of librarians and archivists yet being replaced by AI um, uh, because I, I just think that there's no way to replicate the, the depth of sort of like the human knowledge that goes into the creation of, you know, these incredibly valuable archives and libraries like those that you superintend. So I just wanna thank all of you for participating in this event, knowing that it is at a, a kind of a, dark and gloomy and cold time of year, close to exams for those of us who are on the university calendar and uh, at supper time uh, on the Eastern time zone. So um, thank you very much, Karen, Jean, Libby. Thank you audience for joining us for this conversation. Um, happy holidays, everybody. Oh, uh, I, I did forget um, one, more, one more comment I'd like to make. Uh, for those of you who are graduate students in the audience who are thinking of applying to the Graduate Student Forum. The Graduate Student Forum this year is, uh, sorry, in 2024 is going to be held on June 6th and 7th, 2024 in Boston. And uh, the deadline for applying for that, uh, the committee just decided this week is going to be March 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we will be pushing out specific uh, information about how to apply, and the deadline uh, as well, March 15th for applications for the Graduate Student Forum. I really encourage uh, any, anybody here who's a graduate student who's moving into the dissertation phase to put together a proposal and let us review it. Uh, you also don't have to be a PhD student. We also have uh, accepted a couple of master's students recently. And I also just want to, now that we're speaking about deadlines, um, so March 15th is a deadline for the Colonial Society's uh, Graduate Student Forum. And uh, is it February 1st applications for the NERFC? Is that the deadline? And what is the JCB deadline, Karen? Is it February 1st as well? Or is it January 15th? January 16th. Just January 16th. Things exciting. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you get an extra uh, day, Martin Luther King Day, to finish your application, I suppose, right? Okay. So those are the upcoming deadlines. Students and advisors of students, keep those in mind. Please share this information. Um, again, happy holidays. It was nice to see you all and thank you very much for participating. Bye-bye.